Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this presentation between myself and Andrew Wilson, uh, looking at how we facilitate effective personalised learning support in novel situations, which is a case study of using Microsoft Power Automate and learning cool construction in higher apprenticeships. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Wilson. Uh, I'm a TEL analyst here at Northumbria University. My role is to help develop teaching practice through the use of technology and working with academics to sort of interpret their, their te technological needs. Uh, I sort of ensure technology, content and ped pedagogy work together, sort of following that, that TPAC model. Uh, and I help shape and influence the teaching practice across the institution. And hello, folks. My name is Helen Charlton, and I'm Head of Apprenticeships at uh, Newcastle Business School at Northumbria University. So I look after apprenticeships across a range of programmes within the business group. And the innovation we're talking about today is on one of these programmes. Uh, partly one of the reasons I'm engaged in this is because my research interests are around how practitioner students, that is, those who are practitioners at the same time as being students, engage with learning and what that experience is like. Um, but I'm also really interested in academic literacies, particularly with very uh, uh, mid-career adult learners and how they develop in that route. So the context of this case study is the senior leader higher apprenticeship at Northumbria University. And this is a level seven postgraduate apprenticeship without a degree programme. So we've designed this apprenticeship to be much more like a CPD program and the learners don't have formal modules. And because the program doesn't have formal assessment in the forms of exams or uh, essays and reports in that kind to write, there's not a huge amount of opportunities to practice um, their study skills, their writing skills, etc. The apprenticeship culminates with an endpoint assessment, which is an unaided project. And for a lot of our learners, that's the type of thing they do in their role all the time anyway, which is great. But there may be aspects of what they're expected to do in that project, which they haven't experienced before, particularly things like risk analysis and so on, that not all of them have been um, supported with or had the opportunity to develop. So they're quite a unique set of students. And the university isn't really geared up for this particular type of project because it's very unusual in higher education. So there's no real obvious resources elsewhere. We have very good study skills support through our library, but those resources aren't going to support these learners at this point. The university also has a KPI on mature learner performance as an area for development. So what we wanted to do with this was to ensure that we could support these learners through their endpoint as effectively as possible. There's also a context for this, which sits in three areas of research. And the first of these is the academic practice literacies dichotomy. So we know that um, literacy, the ability to communicate and to put forward your view in written and spoken practice is a social practice. The way we write is embodied in the different types of settings we're in. If you think about these learners, they're very much embodied in a practice setting. And so the academic setting is very different. And we know from writers such as North Edge that it's, uh, learners can find it very difficult to express themselves in ways that are appropriate for assessment. The programme's also embedded very much in um, a model of hutagogy. That is how we empower learners to find their own learning journeys and address their own learning needs that they have identified. Developing curriculums that is about their professionalism and about the things that they're interested in. And one of the things we wanted to do with this uh, case study is try and work out what it is that our learners needed and provide them with the right resources. And we want to do that through personalised learning. So here's the problem. How do we support and develop the writing skills of these uh, mature learners, very experienced professionals, but perhaps grasping um, a task they've never had to do before? How do we accommodate the different levels of knowledge? So from those who've never done it before to those who regularly, for example, write these types of reports, but perhaps want to stretch their skills or want a little more support with it. 
How do we encourage them to engage with academic skills? And how do we do that in the resource scant environments of higher education where we don't have a lot? And so with this context problem in mind, I turned to Andrew and I said, what are we going to do about it? When Helen came to me with this challenge, it was actually quite timely as I was in the middle of studying a postgraduate certificate in academic practice and I needed to conduct a practitioner based inquiry as part of my studies. Therefore, as well as figuring out which tools might solve the problem, I was able to look behind the curtain, as it were, and investigate and, and research what a personalised learning approach involves. So as well as considering the theory behind any proposed solution I was aiming to develop, I also needed to consider the implications of the solution to the Institute as a whole. I began the process by asking some key questions. That is personalisation in the teaching learning assessment process important? Does a personalised approach actually need to be technology enhanced? How will the solution be supported? And will that solution help influence the future of TEL at Northumbria? And more importantly, does it support the strategic aims of the institution? Uh, from the strategy point from a strategy point of view, the top level institutional strategy, which feeds into the TEL strategy via the via IT, includes the highlighted KPI, which has the aim of embedding technology innovation in the curriculum. So I knew I wasn't going to go too rogue with my solution. During the investigation and research I did around personalization and, and personalized learning, I, I, I came up with a number of findings, some of which I've, I've listed here, which I thought uh, were beneficial. So the idea of pedagogy of personalization, this is uh, being cited by Peng and Down uh, over the last couple of years, and they're highlighting four elements uh, which are individual characteristics, individual performance, personal development, and adaptive adjustment. And, and these characteristics are sort of coming together to form a new phrase around technology-empowered effective pedagogy. Again, uh, so there's the use of the words personal and personalised, uh, and these can quite often be sort of misinterpreted uh, and, and mean obviously mean different things. So as identified by Jones, we need to understand the difference between these two words and how personalized is very much more about the qualities and characteristics associated to an individual. Uh, interesting uh, element that I found whilst doing the research was this idea of a choice personalised paradox. Uh, this is the idea that instead of empowering a, a learner, it might actually reduce the learner's control and give them less choice. Uh, so as, again, that's just something to sort of bear in mind when considering personalised learning approach. Again, uh, limitations of personalised learning in TEL, cited by Fitzgerald. This is, you know, very much al along the lines of, you know, it, it, it can be expensive and time consuming. And we need to make sure, you know, is it actually going to improve the learner performance at the end of the day as well? So looking at effective learning and teaching, uh, this is also it's quite a, a, an old uh, reference, uh, Laura Lloyd back in 2005, uh, where she actually describes, uh, you know, well-designed tell can adapt to the learner's needs and is much more possible than, than in non-tell settings. So, and in fact, you know, the idea of, of personalised tell approach is, is, is not a new one. It's just the idea of, of using today's technologies and integrating them. Looking at the benefits of personalised learning, again, Fitzgerald cites the sort of the mac micro, meso and macro uh, benefits. So at, at, the, at the micro level, uh, this is what the, the student is, is going to achieve. This is the personalisation that can increase motivation, improve attitudes towards learning. Uh, the teacher uh, is at the meso level. Uh, it's going to support 
their activities uh, got improved feedback through automation and it frees up their time to focus focus on other tasks and then finally again as, as i already mentioned you know the institution at the micro at the macro level you know can, can we help tackle underachievement and help raise standards so finally uh, in, in terms of looking sort of assessment and how personalized learning fits into that i think for me it brings together elements of assessment as learning and assessment for learning so you've got the students involvement at the as as level so I'll do this again because she keeps slamming the door so finally looking at assessment and, and how personalized learning approach fits into that for me it brings in elements of both assessment as learning and assessment for learning so you've got the students involvement in the learning process and that their use of self-assessment so both these elements are, are answering the you know the assessment as learning and equally assessment for learning so the personalization is it's providing feedback to the students on how they can improve uh, but it's also informing the teacher uh, as well on on the understanding of of the skills and and where help might need to be targeted so after considering the the outcomes of of the research that i conducted uh, it was time for me to consider actually building the solution and and having a look at what tools were available you know to to actually allow that to happen so it was important for me to to start with the end user and and consider them so i needed to find tools that were both you know easily accessible uh, had uh, were fully you know accessible from an accessibility point of view but also in terms of technology you know they, they didn't have any additional downloads or installs uh, and equally it, it needed to have a, a friendly interface and and be simple but effective to use so from a technology point of view uh, I had no budget to buy any additional software, so I had to have a look around what, what we had existing in the institution. Uh, and it would point, obviously had to have the functionality required to, to answer the, the task posed. And if, if it was a new technology to myself, it, it needed to have a steep, fast learning curve so I, I could get on and get the tool built. So in the end, uh, I actually came with the solution of using Microsoft Forms and Power Automate, which are both uh, products of the Office 365 suite, which we have at the university. So let's have a look at the actual tool uh, that I ended up developing. So as you can see here, this is just a simple uh, one question Microsoft Form. Uh, it's it's, obviously, it's a like at scale with seven options, and it's just asking the student to identify how confident or not they are with with these following elements. Uh, as you can see here, I'm already logged in, and it's it, it recognizes who I am, and, and that that's key to to the to the automation element that I'll look at in a minute. So we'll do a quick demo. It's just quick and easy, just to highlight how the student, how the learner feels they are relating to these elements. They hit submit and that is that is all that's required from the student. They will then within a minute or so uh, get an, an email with their personalized learning plan. And if I jump to my email here, as you can see, I've got one prepared early. And this is so like I say, it knows who I am and that, that's key to, to getting the student to sign into to the Microsoft form. Uh, and we've got here, we've got these boxes that relate to those seven elements within that question. So as you can see here on the first one, I was indicated I was confident. And what, what we're doing here is suggesting that if the learner then wants to further their knowledge within that, uh, you know, create an executive summary topic, then this would be the correct resource for them to do that. Likewise, uh, if they felt that they were perhaps a bit overconfident uh, and needed to step back a bit, they could, they could come down to the sort of the intermediate resources 
And then likewise, if, if, if they felt they wanted to start again and, and they'd answered it incorrectly, we were actually giving them the opportunity to access the entry level resource as well. And that just gets repeated for each seven element. So again, that's a confident, but so, so coming down here, so somewhat confident, this is highlighting that intermediate resource that, that, is, that is appropriate to, to their needs. And again, we're offering the opportunities to then uh, further their knowledge or again, go back if, if they wanted to start down a level. And that just gets repeated for each, each of those seven elements. So what is the code to get that to work? So using Power Automate, and this is, a, this is the, the Power Automate itself. Uh, I apologize to anybody, any coders out there. Uh, this might look a little bit messy. Uh, like I say, I, I kind of had to learn from scratch uh, and I'm still learning. And like I say, dare say in the future, I'll learn techniques which, which will help streamline this. But essentially, what happens is a the, the, the flow, the power automates, uh, gets triggered when a new response is submitted to the form. We get the details, but the key bit here is, I won't expand these, uh, it's also getting the user profile. So that's what's dragging out their full name and their email address. Uh, there's a bit of a program, a bit of a delay in there, just, just so the system doesn't get uh, backed up. And then I'm creating a number of variables for each uh, element within that question. So we've got these switches here, and the, these are the bits that, that kind of do the the main organization of the, of the structure of the email. So it looks to see what the answer that, this, that the learner gave, either confident, somewhat confident, or not confident. And depending on that, it assigns the resources in the correct order, which I've you know, pre-written here, and it assigns all, all of that into the variables above. And then if I close this down again, right at the end, uh, I'm constructing an email to, to the email address that I've, I've captured. And then I'm inserting the, the content of the, the, those variables, which were set by these switches. So what we did after we had uh, built that was we asked some of our learners to pilot it. Now, the first cohort of learners who need to build these reports and use these resources to support themselves with that don't actually do that for another six months. Um, and that timing has been really problematic for us because it's been very hard to get the learners to engage with running a pilot. But we did manage to get some to do it. And the ones who engaged with it um, demonstrated to us that we this idea of differentiation of resource based on the skill level was very helpful because they, they quite enjoyed the idea that they were given all of the options in what they saw, but were directed to an option that seemed to be appropriate on the basis of the things they'd selected. So that was very helpful. And we also found something that surprised me a little bit, but that the learners were um, grateful for having very directed resources so that they could use their time very effectively. We know from reports um, like John Butcher's um, shoehorn and sidelined report that part-time learners are extraordinarily time um, pressured. And therefore you can see why that would be useful, that they're given the right kind of resources pitched at the level that they're working at very quickly, and it narrows down the amount of searching that they need to do to find the right kind of things. So we can see the benefits of that in that feedback. As the learners go into doing these reports, we will be continuing to do this feedback process so we can refine this for further iterations of the tool. So in conclusion, um, we did have issues. I personally found it very time consuming to find that initial content. And I think that's because it's not standard academic content. So I couldn't fall back on things I might have used. If we were doing something else, I'd be directing learners to Manchester Phrase Bank and so on. That content wasn't there. So I was relying heavily on industry sources for things that actually I'm not an expert in. And as I said, very problematic to engage learners in a pilot prior to the point of need. 
In, in terms of the building the tool and the, the technology that I, I chose, and like I said before, I, I knew very little about Power Automate other than what I'd seen in, in demos. So I, I knew it could probably do what I needed it to do. I just needed to learn those skills very quickly. And my advice to anybody else having a go at this would just be have a play, uh, see what's out there, watch YouTube videos. And I say, within six months, my my knowledge of Power Automate and what it can do has, has has grown rapidly. And the next time somebody comes along and asks me to do this, I'll be able to produce it a, a, a lot quicker and and advance things as well. Things we found very beneficial in using this tool was, as I said, the learners really like that personalization. It feels very. Um, um, targeted and directed for them so they are in, when they do engage with it they engage with it well once you've got over that initial curation and that initial creation it's very low resource it is now running andrew and i don't touch it the only reason we would go near it is for me to promote it to our learners and they can access it when and wherever they want so there's no time resource that we have to embed into that which is great and likewise it's easily adaptable to other uses. So I've, I've shown this to quite a few other people and, and I'm now working on another uh, a number of other projects using Power Automate to help speed up processes, you know, free up academics time, improve the, the outcomes to the learners. So the benefits are definitely there. So that's our recorded presentation. And I understand we're now going to drop on to live so you can ask us any questions you've got. Um, so we will we'll be with you in a minute.